Hey Mechatronics class, what's up? My name's Cullen, and today I'm going to talk about belt and chain drive. We got a lot to talk about, but I'll be sure to make it a Baja Blast. In order to easily transport power and parts from one place to another, we need machines. These machines are called belt and chain drives, and they fall into two main categories. These categories are conveyor and power transmission drives. Power transmission drives, well, they transmit power from one place to another, and conveyor drives, they transmit the parts from one place to another. The mechanics behind them really aren't that different, so I'll be focusing on the differences between chain and belt drives in this presentation. An important thing to understand with belt and chain drives is the difference between sheaves and sprockets. Belt drives use sheaves, whereas chain drives use sprockets. Sheaves got a groove like this, and sprockets got teeth like this. Belt drives are composed of three main parts. You got the belt, the driver sheave, and the driven sheave. Going into a little bit more detail in each of those, um, belts are typically made of rubber and they have nylon cords inside them to make them stronger. The rubber is for the friction uh, transmitting the power between the sheaves of the driver and the driven. The driver sheave is connected to the shaft of the motor or the other power source and it uses friction to rotate the belt with it. For the driven sheave it's connected to the load and it uses the friction of the belt to turn the load and transmit power. Chain drives are composed of three main parts as well. They all accomplish basically the same purpose as belt drive components. There's the chain, the driver sprocket, and the driven sprocket. The driver sprocket and driven sprocket are the same as sheaves in a belt drive system, they just have teeth. As far as the chain's concerned, you need to know two main things. You need to know what a master link is and pitch. The master link is what connects both ends of the chains together and pitch is the distance between each chain link in a chain. So what advantages do belt drives have over chain drives and vice versa? Well, first off, belt drives are quieter, cheaper, and lower maintenance than chain drives, so you're going to find them way more often. However, chain drives, since they're made out of metal, can handle some more strength-intensive jobs. So you'll see them for stuff like automobiles and bicycles all the time. That's why some examples of belt drives are more light equipment stuff like vacuums, whereas some examples for chain drives tend to involve turning wheels on a car or bicycle or something of that sort. All right, y'all, we're going to do a bit of a speed run for this part. I'm going to go through all the different types of belts and chains here and score them out of 10. I got a lot to go through, so let's go ahead and get into it. Here you can see the O-belt. This is what it looks like. You can probably guess why it's called an O-belt. Here's its sheave. O-belts are round and pretty easy to use. You'll see them sometimes in lathes and bandsaws. Give that a 4 out of 10. Here we got the V-belt. And you can see the little nylon cords holding it together inside. V-belts are the best combo of speed, durability, and friction. So since those are all super important qualities in power transmission drives, you'll see them used pretty often for that. I'll give those a 10 out of 10. Coming in at the most boring here, we got flat belts. They're also the oldest, most ancient type of belt. Um, they're pretty strong. They're actually the strongest out of all of them, but they require super bulky pulleys like this one here to work, so you're not going to see them that often. I'll give those a 2 out of 10. Here we got a timing belt. As you can probably guess by its sheave here, it fits in with these little notches to keep time in a system. 
that's pretty niche, so you're going to see them mostly just used in stepper motors and some engines. But it does its job well, so I'll give it a 6 out of 10. Alright, moving on to power transmission chains, we got the roller chain. You can probably guess why they're called the roller chain. Yeah, that's right, these things here inside the bushes roll. They're the most common and efficient type of power transmission chain, and you'll see them pretty much everywhere. They're used in bikes, cars, motorcycles, tons of stuff. I'll give that a 10 out of 10. Alright, coming up next we got the silent chain. Their main gimmick, as you can probably guess, is that they're silent. <laughs> these are also called the inverted tooth chain. And one advantage these have over other chains is that right here they're able to free flex between each pitch so that they're not as loud. They're really good for high speed power transmission, but they're more expensive than roller chains, so you'll see them used a little bit less often. I'll give that an 8 out of 10. Here we got the leaf chain. Uh, these ones are weird because they're actually not technically power transmission chains, and they use sheaves instead of sprockets. Uh, this is because they're designed to lift stuff, so they're very durable, but they're not able to run at very high speeds. These ones are very niche. I wouldn't worry too much about seeing it on the EOPA. I'll give them a 4 out of 10. Alright, moving on to the conveyor chains here. We got the flat top chain. You can probably guess why it's called the flat top chain. Yep, it's got a flat top. Wow. Um, <laughs> there's not much to say about these. They got these little barrels on the end of them that are curled with pins on each side. And they're conveyor chains. They move stuff give that a 7 out of 10. Alright, engineering steel chains. These are a little bit more interesting than the last ones. They're called engineering steel chains or, or closed end pentel because they're heat treated to make them stronger. So these ones are really strong but they're also a little bit more expensive than flat top chains. I'll give them an 8 out of 10. Alright, and on the last type of chain here we got another conveyor chain. It's the hook joint or the detachable chain. These chains are used when the length between sprockets is fairly short. They're convenient because they're much easier to detach and reattach than other chains. But they're not used in many applications since roller chains are more commonplace and engineering steel is stronger. They're not that great, so I'll give them a 3 out of 10. All right, and since this is engineering, you already know there's gonna be some math stuff involved in belt and chain drives. These pictures may look complicated, but they're basically just trying to, to illustrate one idea, and that's the idea that your driver sheave is going to affect your driven sheave based on how big or small both of those are. So if you have a big driven sheave, driving a smaller driven sheave, this one's going to have more speed and this one's going to have less speed. And working inverse from that is the torque. So if big ones have less speed, they're going to have more torque. And if it's smaller, it's going to have lower torque but greater speed. All right, now that you understand that basic principle, you gotta get into the real math stuff, and that's the drive ratio. For belt drive systems, you're gonna be concerned with the pitch diameter of driver sheaves and driven sheaves. And an important thing to note is that the pitch diameter is the measurement from each nylon cord on the belt, and not just the diameter of the sheave. But basically, in order to find the ratio uh, with and understand the speed and torque of each of your sheaves better, which we'll get into a little bit more detail later, you have to measure the pitch diameter of your driver sheave, which would be this one, and your driven sheave, which would be this one, and you do an equation. The driven sheave goes above the driver sheave, and you come out with a number. It's the same thing for chains basically, except instead of pitch diameter, you gotta work with teeth. So let's say your driver sprocket has 20 teeth, that number would go on the bottom here, 
And if your driven one had, I don't know, 10 teeth, that would go on the top. 10 over 20 is one half, so your sprocket ratio would come out to, wow, one half. All right, to wrap up all the math stuff here, we have these four equations, and they're all very similar. These equations are used to calculate the speed in rotations per minute, or RPM, and torque in foot-pounds. So, as we already know, driver sheaves and sprockets proportionally affect the speed and torque of driven sheaves and sprockets based on the difference in their pitch diameters, or number of teeth. Using this information, we can calculate speed and torque using a proportion. For example, if you wanted to find the speed of your driven sprocket in a, tra in a chain drive system, we would use the chain drive speed proportion here. And let's say, for example, the number of your the number of teeth on your driven sprocket is 12, and the number of teeth on your driver spro on your driver sprocket is 24. You would put the 24 on the bottom here and the 12 on top to get your drive ratio of one half or 0.5. So that would make this proportion S1 over S2 equals 0.5. And if you also knew that your RPM of your driver sprocket is 50, with your driver sprocket going here, that would be 50 over x equals 0.5. You do some math, and you can figure out that's 50 times 50 divided by 1 half is 100. So this number is going to be 100 RPM. And the thing I, the math I just did for that one is basically what you would do for all of these. Except, the only difference between speed and torque is that speed is an inverse proportion. You can see that S2 is down here and N2 is up here. And for torque, it's a direct proportion. You can see T2 is here and N2 is here. I hope you're all still awake after all that math. Um, cause now we gotta talk about alignment. Good boys and girls properly align their tension for their belt drives. That way they get less vibration, belt wear, and heat. So, how do you go about aligning and tensioning your belt and chain drives? Well, you can either use a straight edge in the method seen here, or you can use lasers. You tell me which one's more interesting. All right, and what you're looking for when you align your belt and chain drives. There's a proper way. This is what the proper alignment looks like. This is what offset misalignment looks like. Horizontal misalignment, vertical misalignment. You get the idea. So how do I solve each three of these misalignments? Well, for horizontal offset misalignment, this one right here, you're going to loosen the set screws on your motor. So the set screws are these things right here. You're going to loosen those and push the sheave forward or back. That way it'll fix the gap that's here or here, wherever it may be. For horizontal misalignment, the angular version, which is this one right here, you're going to do basically the same thing. You're going to loosen these set screws and adjust to make them parallel to each other. And then for vertical angular misalignment, you're going to put some shims under it, as you can see here, to fix this problem of misalignment, which will cause your belt to wear very quickly. All right, now we're finally into the last part of the presentation here. As I mentioned earlier, you gotta properly tension and align your belt and chain drives. So for tensioning belt drives, it's a little bit different from chain drives, but this principle is the same between both of them. Obviously, if you move the sheaves or sprockets further apart, the tension is going to increase on your belt or chain, and if you move them closer together, it's going to decrease. Alright, and so for tensioning belt drives, 
you're gonna wanna have a system here where you have a straight edge, your belt drive system, and a tension tester. These things are a little complicated, so pay close attention when I tell you all the steps for it. So, to properly measure the tension of your belt drive system, you want to start by moving the large scale o-ring, that's this one, to the centimeter distance between the center of two sheaves. You can see that in this picture it would be 240 centimeters, so they have it moved to the 240 centimeter mark. And you want to move this small ring over to zero. Place the straight edge on the belt, as you can see here. Put the tension tester in the middle distance. Make sure it's in the center, as seen in this picture. Press down until the large O-ring gets to the zero mark. So as you press down, this thing's gonna move down to the zero mark. And as you do that, this small O-ring is going to move up the scale and it'll give you a force reading. After that, all you have to do is look at a chart and see whether or not the force is cool and good. All right, and finally, for tensioning chain drives, it's a little bit different, actually easier than belt drives. <laughs> um, measuring chain sag, as it's called, you just need two straight edges, and you're gonna use the 2% rule to adjust your chain sag. What's the 2% rule, you may be wondering? Well, your chain sag should be 2% of the center distance. So, let's say the distance from here to here is 200 centimeters. Well, 2% of 200 is four. <laughs> and so you're going to have a chain sag of four centimeters from this center distance in that hypothetical scenario. Proper chain sag is very important because if you have it too loose, it's not going to work properly. It's going to basically wear your chain down very quickly. And if you have it on too tight, it'll shoot off like a slingshot and probably hurt someone. Um, so keeping all that in mind, I hope you took good notes on this stuff. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much all for the belt and chain drive systems. If you're still awake, thank you for paying attention. And I hope you all have a great day. Bye.